The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to a special San Diego Comic-Con episode of Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. I'm one of your hosts, James Floyd. I am a freelance writer for Star Wars Insider Magazine and StarWars.com. And I'm your other host, Melissa Miller. I also write for Star Wars Insider Magazine and am a freelance science writer. This episode, Star Wars Ologies presents one of our panels called The Science of Superpowers, moderated by me. So this year at Comic-Con, we worked as part of the Steam Pop Network, which is a coalition of several other STEM-focused groups, including the Fleet Science Center, the If Then Ambassador Program, and Cosplay for Science. We're excited for you to listen to the panel. Let's do it. Hi, my name is Melissa Miller. I'm a science communicator and a science writer. Uh, I run a science podcast for Star Wars called Star Wars Ologies, and for the Fast and the Furious franchise called The Facts and the Furious, coming soon. Um, I just love asking these sorts of nerdy questions to people who know the answers. So that's basically what this is about. Thanks for coming out and joining us. We are recording the panel and it will be available as a podcast and on the Star Wars Ologies um, YouTube after this. So um, if you want to take a picture of the QR code and share it with us or share it with your friends and stuff who couldn't be here. Um, I want to acknowledge before we get started all of the creative people who are in SAG and the WGA who are striking right now without whom these characters wouldn't have uh, continued, to, continued life, so. And there will be time for audience Q&A. This is the last panel of the room, so they said they'd give us a little extra time. And then our scientists will be available in the hallway after that uh, if you've got more questions. Um, we do ideally not want to answer a lot of well actually questions. Um, so just want to let you know we've got we know superheroes and supervillains have multiple origin stories and multiple types of powers and all that kind of stuff. We picked something to talk about here and, uh, and we'll happily answer any speculative questions uh, towards the end. So, um, uh, If you've been to other panels this weekend, these are all the ones that are going to be online um, on YouTube and on our podcast and stuff like that. Um, hopefully you made it out to some of these other nerdy panels this weekend. Uh, and I'll put this up again at the end. Um, we just like to make all of our science content available for free for those who can't make it to the con. So, all right, well, I'm going to have my awesome team of panelists and scientists here introduce yourself. Let's just start with you, Esther, and go down the line. Tell us who you are, what kind of science you do, and what kind of superpower you already have. All right, so my name is Esther Kwan. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of bioengineering at UC San Diego. Uh, my research involves looking at nanotechnology for the brain, and I would say my superpower because we work on nanotechnology to see really, really small things. Um, hi, I'm Kat Schreinkel, and I'm also an assistant professor, and I'm at San Diego State University. I actually just started my lab last August, so if you have questions about what that's like. Um, and I study cell biology and how cells and animals protect themselves, both from pathogens and toxins or pollutants. And we use the sea urchin embryo and uh, stem cells as our model organisms in the lab. And my superpower is not throwing up right now with how nervous I am. biologist working on cell division at UCSD, and I also create science art, fashion, and video games to share the beauty of science with the world. And my superpower in the lab is basically I shoot lasers at cells to <laughs> fight cancer. So to expand it a little bit is what I do is I use lasers to make cells glow under the microscope so I can see how they divide. And so my dress, what I'm wearing right now, is actually a perfect example. So these are real pictures of human cells that I took under the microscope with lasers and microscopes. And the aim is to study how they divide so we can better understand and treat cancer. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Latasia Jones, also known as Hey Dr. Tay. I am a neuroscientist who is currently at NIH, and my past research focused on 
um, early career, sorry, early career, early uh, brain development, such as issues that cause that are in children, such as autism, um, and I also focused on movement disorders like Parkinson's and dystonia. And I have a tad bit of experience in addiction. Um, so anybody and everybody that knows anything about an addiction, we can definitely talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, my superpower, I'm going to go a little off the rip and say, I love being able to educate any and every audience. Uh, whether you're young, old, in the middle, um, whatever anxieties you have, disorders you have, I'd like to come to your level to make sure you leave here knowing something you did not know before. So that would be my superpower. Hey everybody, my name is Erica Anderson. I am a mechanical and reliability engineer in the consumer products industry. So if you like using paper plates, tissue, towels, napkins, I'm the person that supports all the equipment that continues to get those things to you. So sorry about the pandemic. I wasn't in this industry yet. I wasn't my fault. <laughs> I came from petrochemicals, so don't hold that against me. And um, my superpower is I can see the future. And so all of the equipment that we work with, I use statistics to understand the probability of failure, what is the highest consequence, and I use that risk assessment to find out which equipment is going to fail first, and which am I going to help mitigate? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Nolasco, but I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> I have a PhD. My background is in molecular biology, and uh, particularly I did a lot of R&D and product development in biotech for different genetic treatments. I did decades of this. Um, and was really part of the start of biotech in San Diego. I left science and went to art school, so I did a lot of design work too. And then I realized I really like both. And so I went into thinking about how do scientists visualize things that they can't see? What, when things are invisible and you want to study them, how do you do that? How do scientists think about that? And how do they communicate that to one another? So really a lot of looking at creating visual data and then looking at that data and how do scientists interpret it and make sense out of it? And then how do they make more simple visualizations for maybe someone who's not as experienced or see where their visualizations are lacking or how do they transform it to show some other property of whatever invisible thing that they're studying is. And my superpower, totally going off beaten track, um, I like endurance hula hooping. Um, I, 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 I picked that up over the pandemic, so I did a lot of miles in my living room with my hoop. Yeah. All right, well, let's get right into our superpowers here. Uh, Esther, you are up first with Elastigirl. All right, so Elastigirl, her superpowers are elasticity, susceptible to cold, and it's noted that she's also a mother. And so, um, I that's there, a superpower, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so is there a scientific basis to her superpowers? I would say yes. There are people with, um, next slide please, thanks. Uh, so there's people with super uh, hypermobility of their joints or stretchy skin. Uh, and a lot of these people have a mutation in one of their genes called collagen. And so we have a lot of different collagens. Um, but basically you can see a picture of collagen up there on the right hand side and it's a protein and when assembled with other collagen molecules they make long fibrils which make our muscles and tendons and so they add a lot of the strength um, to our tissues and so the mutation basically makes these fibrils um, easier to unfold so they can go from shrunken to long uh, slide against each other and so that's where you get that super stretchiness um, and so regards to her susceptibility to cold, uh, this is a lot of materials when you make them cold, they become more brittle. So you can think of like a rubber band that's super cold. Uh, maybe you saw a YouTube video about this and you can smash it with a hammer and it basically shatters. So that brittleness is a lot of materials. And then uh, just a comment on her being a mother, um, I would say that probably if she gave vaginal delivery, she probably had an easier time. <laughs> <laughs> So is snapping back into shape part of some, you know, if it's part of a superpower, is that something that's, you know, realistic uh, with the collagen stuff that you're talking about? 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, a lot of our proteins have a native shape, and then when you can stretch them out, and they'll spring back just like a slinky, so they have memory um, of their previous shape, so they will snap back to their original shape sometimes. Okay. All right, next up, we have Spider Gwen. This is you, Beata. Yes, so I'm um, Spider Gwen. She's also known as Ghost Spider. I guess I don't really have to introduce her, but what's really interesting about her is, to me, how she obtained her superpowers. So she was bitten by a radioactive spider, which then gave her new abilities, like, you know, super um, fast reaction time and being able to climb walls. And um, her origin story is actually not as impossible as it seems, because radiation actually can make changes in our DNA. But the difference is that these changes are random. So if you think of your DNA as a genetic, genetic code as a string of letters in a book, um, and you start randomly changing letters, most likely what you will get is something that is very hard to understand. So if you have a genetic code that is not easy to understand, best case scenario is probably nothing happens. Worst case scenario is you could get diseases like cancer. So I don't think we know of anyone who got superpowers from radioactivity, but we know of a lot of people who got really sick from radiation. So definitely don't try this at home. <laughs> but, um, but if you want to obtain a new gene, how else could that work? Normally, we inherit genes from our parents, right? Um, and can you please switch to the next oh, yeah. slide? Sorry. Awesome. So yeah, vertical gene transfer. So you obtain new genes from your parents. But there's this other thing in nature that's really fascinating, and it's called horizontal gene transfer. And that basically means that genes can be transferred between organisms and sometimes even between different species without having the need to go through um, kind of mating and reproductions. And so um, the idea is that it's possible that there could be gene transfer between spiders and other organisms. Yeah, so um, then the other thing, so, and there's examples about these gene transfers. For example, when you think about bacteria, they often transfer genes between each other to get antibiotic resistance, which is an issue sometimes in medicine. Or for example, centipedes, they've shown that they got genes from um, fungi or bacteria that make them more venomous. So it's definitely a possibility. And the other thing that fascinates me about spider Gwen is, um, is her ability to, to have the, the web shooting tool. So basically she can shoot the spider silk and um, it allows her to attach to surfaces and swim through the air. So actually scientists have been able to recreate spider silk in the lab. And the way they do it is they take genes from the spider, they put them into bacteria, and then they isolate a material that's very similar to spider silk and has some really amazing properties. And so what fascinates me about this is that um, all of these breakthroughs and ideas from our research from the lab are not things that we come up from scratch, but they are things taken from other places in nature. So yeah, the possibility of having like, a device like this in the future one day might be actually realistic using genes from different organisms. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Was anyone here in the Science of Spider-Man panel last night? Yeah, okay, a couple of people. I really enjoyed that the scientists running, or one of the scientists on that panel was like, talking about how they're still kind of tempted to like, let a spider ride them. Just, just in case. I'm assuming that's not recommended though. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, Michelle, can you take us uh, through Storm? Sure, so I'm sure that you're the first. Yeah, I get it. Uh, we're all familiar with Storm, so she's got these great powers to control the weather, right? Wind can help her fly, and lightning, and all the things. And she's also a teacher. Um, so, um, if we think in particular about the lightning, right? And what has that potential to carry an electric charge. Well, we do, right? Our brain sends signals through our nerves that make our muscles move. I wanna walk, I wanna make muscle, right? You can make muscle, you can do that. So, what on this planet now can do that with electricity? Electric eel, right? So, electric eels are gross, but amazing <laughs> also. <laughs> and that they can they have specialized cells. So the top, the top left, a couple of beauty shots there for you to see. Um, it's also a fish. It's not really an eel. So that's something also interesting about it. 
but the shape of its dog body is elongated like an eel. And it's actually 80% of its body, um, by mass and by volume, is dedicated to specialized cells called electrocytes, which is on the bottom right. Um, these are specialized cells that are actually kind of a, a modified or came along the line of a muscle cell. So the same thing, its brain can send a signal through its neurons to these specialized electrocytes, which are stacked by the thousands along the length of its body. And the brain says, hey, I see something I want to eat. Um, and it sends a charge to one side of the cell. And the cell membrane has, to the top right, um, these transmembrane proteins that are ion channels that allow the ions to go from one side to other. So now the cell is positive on one side and negative on the other side. You put a thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them together in a series, and then its brain has the ability to say, all at once, release that charge. And that's how electric eel can like, stun huge alligators. <laughs> um, and so if you think about maybe storm, no, we're not really on this, but we already have brains, we have neurons, we're, we have a type of muscle cell, right? And we have this intentional control over our muscles. Maybe storm has something about her mutation, right? That allows her muscle cells, maybe she has more ions, she can generate more charge or some other thing like that. And her brain has the control to do a really fast release. You know, some people's muscles are really strong and they can like hit a, hit a ball with a bat really quickly and some of us can't. Um, <laughs> so maybe she has this intentionality to be able to control electricity and charge through her body, kind of the same way that we use our muscles now. Yeah, now I'm picturing like young Storm, you know, like wiping your feet on the carpet and stabbing all her siblings <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> that doesn't seem quite fair. Uh, all right, Latasia, why don't you take us through Jean Grey? Absolutely, and I'm so glad Michelle went before me because she gave you a great foundation to talking a little bit about Jean Grey, right? Uh, so Jean Grey is known for her telepathy, telekinesis, and she's a great teacher. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? But what I want to definitely, is because we already have the foundation here, I want to take you another route, just in case we lost anyone through understanding the foundation of neuroscience and neuronal firing, right? So in your brain, you have a, about 100 billion neurons, and they're spiking about 200 times per second. And I've been doing this little experiment for the past few days at a steam fair for if then is conducting right now at the Comic-Con Museum. So I want to kind of do it all, do it with you all if you're if you're if you're willing to participate. Can I get okay? Good. So can you free both of your hands? All right. I'm gonna say ready three times. I'm gonna say ready, ready, ready. On the third ready, I need you to clap as many times as you can, and then I'm gonna say one once I count to one second. When I say one, that means stop clapping. But you need to count how many times you clap in that one second. You ready? All right. That didn't count. <laughs> ready, ready. Ready, one. <laughs> How many times did you clap? Seven, anybody over seven? Nine? Okay, imagine if you could clap 200 times in that one second. That's what your neurons are doing. Right, you, what, yeah, you would probably tear up your limbs in some way or fashion, right? <laughs> so that is not our superpower, but <laughs> But in this situation, when I'm talking about neurons, you want to be able to have that many signals and the spiking to occur at that rate, right? Imagine a fire happening in the middle of this room, please. No one quote that, no one believe this. It is not happening. But imagine a fire happening in the middle of this room. Would you want your brain to be able to re react as fast as you clapping 200 times in that one second, or as fast as neurons spiking 200 times in the one second? The neurons, right? You wanna move as fast as the neurons. Great, so this is how your brain receives these signaling and is basically saying, hey, warning, get out of there, emergency, run, fright, flight, whatever you need, right, at that moment. So this is really important for us to keep our brains in good shape. So exercising, eating healthy, sleeping, even just practicing and going over things, meditating. Um, I'm dressed as she hopes. So exercising and controlling your emotions, right? Because you want to bring yourself back to a peaceful state so you can be clear-minded and make great decisions moving forward, right? 
Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about that telekinesis, tele telepathy uh, powers that Gene has as, re as, as well. Um, the ability to move objects using your mind. So it's not too far reached when you think about it. There are a lot of prosthetics that use the recording of brain signals after an individual loses a limb and using uh, for a long time their muscles are stimulated by those brain signals and especially in what, what we call a phantom limb, right? And those, because it's still receiving those, those signals to move it in whatever direction and ways, if you immediately get to a neurologist who can record those signals, they can utilize those signals and it's essentially attach it or connect it, connect it to a prosthetic, which would essentially give you more natural movement as if you never lost the limb, right? So this is not too far reach. We actually do have this ability to control objects with our mind. It just takes a little bit of engineering, science, and a lot of brain. So thank you. Good job getting everyone to participate. I'm impressed with the crowd at 2 p.m. on Sunday of Comic Con. Everyone's awake. All right. Okay, next up, uh, Kat, can you take us through? I, when I was doing my research, I realized that Sue Storm and Violet uh, from The Incredibles have the exact same powers. I'm sure I should have realized that about 20 years ago, but so we decided not to choose. Yeah, so um, these two scientists, oh, uh, sorry, ahead of myself, these two superheroes uh, have the ability to bend light waves in order to become invisible. And these can either happen from exposure to a cosmic storm, in the case of Sue Storm, or um, born this way in the case of Violet Parr. And so can anyone think of in the animal kingdom the ability to change your appearance or become invisible? Octopus, yeah. Chameleon, yeah. Awesome, so next slide. We're actually gonna talk about what's under the sea and cephalopods, so these are um, squid, cuttlefish, octopuses, not octopi, which I always have to remind myself. <laughs> and they have these really specialized cells. There's three types, so there's chromatophores, um, iridophores, and leucophores. And what these do are, these are really special cells, so on the left side of the screen here, we have a zoom in on the skin of a squid. And these cells are very complex, they're enervated, which means they have neurons with them, and they also have a lot of very specific muscle control within them. And in the center, kind of that red sac, is a sac of pigments. And so these pigments can absorb or reflect light at different wavelengths, and that's just the science way of saying different colors. Uh, and so these different cells have the ability to reflect the light, absorb, or um, enhance their pigment to change the color. And a lot of marine invertebrates uh, actually are kind of transparent and clear to begin with. And so it's just fascinating if you look on the right side, that's um, a squid being kind of invisible against a white background, and then the color change against uh, a more patterned background. And just a shout out, if you're interested in squid facts, because there are so many, they're very cool, um, I invite you to check out uh, Sarah McAttack on Twitter. She also, she lives in Philly, so she also has fun Philly facts, and she's hilarious, and um, she has this thing where you can text 1833-psi-text um, and get a squid fact. <laughs> That's her superpower. Well, I heard in some other science panel this weekend, and it kind of blew my mind, so maybe you can answer it. Uh, if you were bending light waves to go around you, does that mean you're blind? Does that mean no light waves are hitting your eyes? Yeah. Or if they, you aren't blind, does that mean your eyes are just floating there in space and everyone can see them? <laughs> Someone asked this in a, in a science panel, I was like, oh man. Right. <laughs> the next question you on the spot. Yeah, the short answer is I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a panel on it next year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're gonna look into that. Okay. Tell you those. All right. Yeah, there you go. We'll have some data for you next year. All right, last but not least in our rotation, Erica Asgar. Yeah, so first of all, uh, show of hands, do you know who Garnett is? Woo, all right. I feel great about it. So for those of you who don't, I absolutely adore her, hence why I wanted to look like her. 
Garnett is from Steven Universe. That show is about crystal gems. So there are different gems, ruby, sapphire, some of them pictured here, ruby and sapphire. They all have different abilities. And Garnett is the strongest crystal gem. So I love that you already gave us a background. Electricity, once again, someone else who is able to generate electricity. And we've heard a background on it, but I also want to offer, because I am an engineer, an engineering perspective on it. So we know about static electricity, walking on carpet, maybe touch the doorknob. You didn't pass out though. We don't necessarily generate that much. It is a, we do have the ability. However, from a safety perspective, personal protective equipment, we can only take so many bullets. You know, there is a certain point you're you're gonna kick the butt, bucket. So with me working in manufacturing, I work with a lot of electrical engineers, we work with maintenance technicians. Anytime you see them, they're gonna have on a special types of gloves. You know, we use things like rubber to resist that so that they're not gonna get injured. You know, but for Garnett, even though she does have really nice thick gloves, she doesn't necessarily need them as PPE to stop electricity from her because she's the one generating it. Now the people she tosses it at, that's their problem. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> So her other ability, which is why I said I'm just like her, is that she's able to see the future. So those glasses that she wears, they're shaped like a star because she's got a, a third eye in the middle of her forehead. Now, the beauty of it is that she doesn't just see one future. She sees multiple scenarios of the future and has to decide, well, which one am I going to go after? And so similarly, she's using, it's basically a risk assessment. Risk is probability of failure times the consequence of failure. And so in her mind, she's able to quickly, you see her respond, but for us, it's gonna take a lot longer. For her, she can immediately do these calculations of, well, what's the highest probability scenario? What's the worst consequence? Okay, I'm gonna go after that one to mitigate. And although we as humans, do we necessarily see the future? No. As an engineer and a data analytics person, can I see the future? Absolutely. And it's likely similar to how she can do it. So a lot of the equipment that I work with in our manufacturing plants, as we all know, they can fail. If you drive a car, you probably know. If you don't drive it right, if it's not designed right, you're not doing the maintenance, you're not rotating those tires, things like that, it's gonna kick the bucket. You know, those three things are what give us good reliability. Same thing about if you've ever seen a car recall. Well, we tried to look at the future, we considered every failure mode that we could think of with this car, and then somehow down the line, we found something else that may have been wrong. And next thing you know, you're sending it back. Totally happens all the time. We do the best we can with the data that we have. But now that we have big data, our abilities to predict the future have gotten even better. Because now I can collect data. I have temperature data, I have vibration data. I know what my equipment looks like when it's doing okay. It's almost like a baby. If you have a child, you babysit a child. They don't speak English, but they do know how to communicate. My equipment can't speak English, and I guess that's another power see the future and I can talk to inanimate an objects. <laughs> they can't talk to me back, but we do speak the same language. Based on that data, I know when my equipment is going wrong. I may not know what's wrong yet, but I know there's an anomaly here. And we can build models for that. That's what the data is for. We're able to build predictive models that can do anomaly detection and tell me, hey, something's off here. You go a little further, vibration data, you can do a fast Fourier transform to take that data and transform it to find out, well, what kind of thing is going on here? If you dig deep enough, that can help us point us in the right direction of how to solve it. And for those of you who've ever used like ChatGPT, the, the AI pictures, thank you for helping them form a new model. They're using <laughs> your data to train a model and it gets even better and even better. Same thing with my equipment. The more data that I can get, even when it fails, I don't like having to fix it, but I actually do like failure because I just learned something about my equipment. I learned what's wrong, I learned how to fix it. So the more data I can get, including when it dies, we can live on with it. Yeah. And I love the last one, because it is her strongest superpower. I know the others sounded great, but the difference between Garnett and the other crystal gems, all crystal gems can fuse, and they fuse mainly when they have to, because they want to be stronger in battle. They do it on purpose, because they needed it. Garnett did not. Garnett is the only one that was born from two of crystal gems, so the one shown here, Ruby and Sapphire, who fell in love, and they chose each other. So another reason why I love her is because I am here, myself, and I work in an industry, we share a lot in common. And so to know that she is one of the ones that had a partner, she fell in love with her partner, and they grew together. Because they chose each other, that is why she's so strong. And from a science perspective, 
love really does have that impact. And I am not the scientist, so not gonna say. So I'm, she's tagging me in because I wanna talk about love a little bit. Has anybody been in love, in love, in lust, maybe? <laughs> Raise hands, nobody? Oh, okay, I was about to say. So when we talk about love, there's some chemicals that release in your brain, such as oxytocin, right? But I think the most exciting part about oxytocin, have you ever been afraid to approach someone that you were attracted to or interested in? That oxytocin starts to take over and it builds away from the fear, which essentially comes from a brain region called the amygdala. And that removal of the fear allows you to approach the person, allows you to grow with the person, be more vulnerable with the person because you're allowing that oxytocin to take over. And there's some other things that I definitely want to make sure I make mention, right? So the other parts of, you know, at the beginning where it's all lovey-dovey and you're in a honeymoon phase and you're doing all the boring stuff that you would usually call boring, but because you're so much like this person, you're like, oh, that's because... <laughs> That's also a chemical response to that love and that lust and that interest, right? So I want you all to remember that when we're in the beginning of our relationships, a lot of those chemical brain responses are taking over. You may not really like that activity, and that's why a lot of times at the five-year mark, you're like, oh my God, are we still doing this? I don't want to do this anymore, you know? Because now that chemical is like, you're, you're, you've gotten yourself back, and you're like, okay, that little honeymoon phase is over. I can now combat that chemical and say, I actually really don't like that because I love you. I stuck with it for the last five years. <laughs> but the flip side of it is, has anybody ever been in a bad relationship and they little toxic? Yeah, sometimes it happens, right? Where you're looking in the cell phone and you're like, I know they're not texting such and such. Your serotonin is taking over. And that's another neurotransmitter that's basically taking you more into a depressed state or thinking about the negatives of your relationship. All these things are very important. So when we talk about Garnett, when we talk about love, we are also talking about neuroscience and aspect. Thanks. All right, they did let us know that since we're the last panel of the day in this room, we can go a little bit over, but we've probably got to get through another round here. Um, so let's start back with you, Esther, with Black Widow. All right, so Black Widow, uh, her superpowers are described as enhanced white blood cells, uh, resistance to aging and disease, and accelerated heating, healing, and she got these through um, human experimentation. All right, so is there a scientific basis behind her superpowers? Oh, yeah, this is the video, right? All right, so uh, I want to tell you about um, some recent um, advances in research. And so um, there's this new therapy called uh, chimerogen antigen receptor T cells, uh, also short uh, CAR T cells, if you can't remember uh, the big mouthful. And so this is introduced relatively recently. And what it is is basically cells that are taken out of your body engineered with a new molecule, which allows it to find cancer cells specifically, um, expanded, so uh, made uh, many more cells, and then reintroduced uh, into the body. And what's so super exciting about this is that in some patients, it's actually curative. So people with blood cell cancers, uh, it cures them by getting this treatment. And so um, uh, I wanted to show this video about these CAR T cells killing cancer, so you can see it. Yep, those small dots are the T cells that have been engineered, and then those big cells are the cancer cells, and you can see they're just really kicking the cancer's butt. All right. <laughs> so uh, this technology uh, has been around uh, for a few years, uh, FDA approved, so uh, cleared for use, and people are developing new technologies to uh, further advance these immune therapies to treat other diseases as well. Yes, so duplicate is, I think she's really awesome because she has a very unique superpower. She is able to create identical copies of herself instantly and that they can help her in all kinds of situations. And that's actually not so far-fetched because our cells are able to do the same thing when they divide, right? So they first copy the DNA, they pull it apart and then split to create two identical copies. The big difference is that our bodies are made of a lot of cells. Any guesses of how many cells we have in our bodies? <laughs> Very accurate. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to say the number because it's probably very hard to guess. It's 37 trillion cells. So if you want to make a copy of your body, 
that means that all of these cells somehow have to divide simultaneously at the same time, which is um, a little bit hard to imagine. So when cells divide in nature, they actually divide one at a time. And if you could please play the video, you will, you will see in this video what this looks like in a fish embryo. So you can see you start with one cell, it starts dividing, and then all of the cells divide one by one. And this happens a lot of times until you have enough cells to make a whole body, to make tissues, to make organs, and to make a brain. So when scientists uh, have been able to make clones in the lab, they are able to do that, but the clones grow from a baby to an adult. So they don't have the same memories, for example, right? They just have the same DNA. So if you want to clone your pet, um, it would be the same pet, and we just have the same DNA. But the amazing thing about Duplicate is she actually has the same memories as her clones. So how would that work? So um, there are some really interesting examples in nature. Um, so maybe, I don't know how long this video will be no, going, I but just, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to show the other picture. So for example, there is this um, organism called planarian flatworm, and they have this ability that when you cut them into pieces, they're able to regrow their bodies. So um, each of these pieces is going to be able to regenerate and create identical copies of the original. And there's been some research where they found that some of these some of these worms are able to retain their memories, even those where the brain was regrown after being cut off. So we don't know how this works, but um, it's a remarkable ability, and maybe it can somehow help explain duplicates' powers, that she can do the, make the duplication and then also retain her memories. Yeah. I feel like somewhere out in the metaverse, there's a, a multiverse, there's a flatworm man or something like that. So. <laughs> I need to look it up. Sure. <laughs> All right, and next, uh, back over to you, Michelle, for Aspen Matthews. Hi. Does anyone know who Aspen Matthews is? is? All right, come from people. Fathom the comic book, um, which is a great comic book that you can actually read online. You can check it out from. Depending on where, depending on where you live, um, you can check it out from uh, Library Pass or your public library. Um, definitely worth a read. Very cool. Um, and so Aspen Matthews, she is the protagonist of the story, and she shows up on a ship at 11 years old. Doesn't know where she came from. People on the ship doesn't. They don't know where she came from. And so she just looks like a 11 year old girl. But it turns out that she's got a little bit on some other 11-year-old girls and continues to develop uh, as she gets older. So she can control water. She has aqueous body transformation. So if you look at the far, there's four panels there. Um, at the bottom, you can see on the far left and the far right at the bottom, you can see her body kind of just turns into bubbles and swirls. Um, and then she's also, uh, I guess, native of San Diego. So uh, at 11, <laughs> 11 years old, she uh, went to UCSD and got her PhD in, in marine biology. But she's actually not a human. She is from uh, a cross of two different underwater um, beings, types of beings, um, which is interesting, um, just like Garnet, uh, combination of two different things often can give enhanced powers and and plants we call it hybrid vigor right so sometimes you have something that's not quite as strong you know and you get them together and boom you got lots of good stuff happening um, or if you have something that's strong and something that's not very weak you cross and you can get them get something a little bit stronger or something really cool you know that you're not expecting okay so that's a little bit of background on Aspen Matthews and who she is so it turns out she was learning how to scuba dive and she got so caught up in the moment she realized that she hadn't breathed for a while. <laughs> and that's how she uh, figured out maybe um, not sure what's going on and why I'm a little bit different. And she is also all about the water, swims with dolphins and surfs. She was an Olympic swimmer. Um, and at one point she, long story, but she loses consciousness, she ends up in the hospital quite a bit later and so they're looking at her and they're doing checking her stats and they're looking at her and she's 77 percent water which is quite high we're usually about 50 percent um, she has a whole separate section of her brain 
kind of like a tumor, but it's all brain tissue. In her lungs, her alveoli, she has like five to seven times more, I think, alveoli in our lungs than we do. And that's the surface where you do your oxygen exchange, right? So you breathe in, so you think, oh, all right, so she's got some other like things happening too. Um, and so thinking about um, breathing underwater. So she, she looks like a land-dwelling mammal, like we are. Um, and, but if you think of beings that live under the water, maybe an electric eel, um, <laughs> they can breathe water. They're all look at air-breathing fish, right? So that's weird, that doesn't really happen. Um, and that, personally, I think of as a little bit of a superpower, how electric eel can use that. They can actually jump out of the water and make physical contact with something and electrocute it. That would be really bad. <laughs> right? But if you wanted to get, you know, if you wanted to get something on the shoreline, it's not, it's not limited to being in the water. And so now on the other hand, if you think about mammals who live in aquatic mammals, right? Like dolphin and whales and what else lives in the water? Yeah. Right, but not a mammal. Um, right, but uh, manatee. Right? They are like need air the way we do, but they can go underwater for, I think the record is over three hours for a particular type of whale, right? How do they do that? How are they different? Well, they have a lot of differences. Well, we, one of the things we know about air, I mentioned the alveoli, right? And so you think, oh, maybe they have really, really big lungs and then get a lot of air in there. Well, that's actually opposite. Their percent of lungs, like a whale, we have about like 7% think takes up our space of our lungs and they're about three percent so they're doing something they're doing something besides having really big lungs another thing we know about getting air into our system is hemoglobin right so hemoglobin is the molecule that oxygen in your red blood cells that oxygen binds to so when you inhale through your lungs the air goes through your alveoli and goes to your red blood cells binds to the hemoglobin and then it can be transported throughout your body Right? Well, it turns out that whales and other water-dwelling mammals have a lot more hemoglobin. So they can carry a lot more blood. Their lungs are also really, really flexible. So you, have you ever heard of someone getting in an accident and they have a collapsed lung, like a human, and that's a really bad thing? Well, whales and dolphins, they do that intentionally. Mm -hmm. So they have really flexible lungs, and so they can expand them and contract them really fast. So it makes a really efficient breathing. So you know they come up to, if they come up and you see them spout, they don't hang out there a long time catching their breath. Oh, I had my, I was holding my breath for three hours. Like I stay up here for a while and you know, you get better. No, they come up, they do their little blow thing, they get their air, they go right back down, right? They have really, really efficient lungs, even though they're not that big. And they have a lot of hemoglobin. And then they also have a lot more myosin in their muscles. So we also hold oxygen in our muscles. Right? And the myosin they have is <clears throat> interesting that it actually has, we're going to go back to the charge thing, right? The surface of the my the myoglobin, what did you say? Um, is if you have too much, it's a protein, it's really sticky, right? So like if a human has too much um, myoglobin in their muscles, they have a lot of problems. But with dolphin and manatee and whales, they actually develop a negative charge on the sur surface of their myoglobin so that the myoglobin mo molecules repel each other so it doesn't get all sticky and muck up. So all these marine mammals have these kinds of adjustments uh, and similar to the way that Aspen Matthews uh, can have and then on the other side, we still have our electric eel doing its air breathing thing. And actually, when electric eels breathe, they don't do the gill, they're fish, right? So you think gills? No, they don't. They open their mouth and they absorb oxygen in their mouth and in the insides of their cheeks. They have a lot of folds on the insides of their cheeks to make a lot of surface area. So kind of like having a lot of alveoli to be surface area. If you, so they're ugly enough, right? Can you imagine one opening its mouth and seeing like a lot of folds and fleshy stuff in there? That wouldn't be good. And then it zaps you and then you, know, you want to go on your way. But, okay. but think about dolphin. Much
choice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely the superpower I would choose, I think. So, all right, I want to make sure we get through the last few uh, things here before I do um, All right, Letizia, you're up with Killer Frost. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, Killer Frost, to make it quick, because I know we're picking up on some time. So, her superpowers are converting heat to cold. She creates shields and projectiles of ice, controls dual personalities. She's a scientist. I'm not biased, but I am. Um, so just to point out one particular thing. So when we think about Killer Frost and you know her, her issue with going back and forth in her identity and trying to understand whether or not to be, she kind of goes like this, this superhero versus villain aspect and trying to control it, right? It may, automatically makes me think of certain um, disorders such as identity dissociation disorder, schizophrenia, and so on. And these things are associated with an imbalance in certain neurotransmitters, such as too much dopamine, or even a, a, some abnormalities with the cortex, which is a region in the brain that is associated most of the times with these disorders as well. So kept that quick, ask me some questions later, okay? <laughs> yeah, we can always get into the weeds. Uh, we've got a lot more slides, but we'll, um, all right. So next up, Kat with uh, Mystique. Yeah, so um, Mystique is really awesome because she can do all of this shape-shifting in both her appearance and voice. She has a really long life. Um, she's queer. She's a superpower. Superpower to <laughs> come. And so her powers for shape-shifting are from mutant genes. Uh, so she was essentially born that way. And so when discussing how she does this camouflage, I want to come back to our favorite cephalopods. And they actually not only have these cells that can reflect and bend light, they actually have uh, skin that can do movements and create shapes that really help them camouflage and mimic what's around them. So if you want to jump to the video. So hopefully you can see this, it's a little dark, but just like whoop, it's a little whoop thing. I wish it came with sound effects, but I'll just make it. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that real time? Like that's, that's real time, wow. yeah. Okay. And uh, so this was recorded outside of uh, Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory. And so some people describe these as little muscly balloons, which I think is my favorite description of anything ever in science. And so essentially uh, they're called these um, papillae is the more formal term. And if you go back to the regular slide, yeah. These are controlled by, again, the nervous system as well as muscles. And so down on the lower right, you can kind of see this um, muscly balloon that is also covered with those cells that can change, um, change their shape. Very cool. Yeah. And right. then, oh, oh, no, you, oh, you got it. Yeah, yeah. So there's a second component to Mystique, which is her long life. So how does she actually do that? And we have a lot of cells, again, going through the cells animals going under the sea that have very long lives. So here pictured in the middle are one of my favorite animals, sea urchins, so the big guy, red sea urchin. Any guesses how old that can be living in the ocean? Two years, more? A long time, yeah. yeah. I feel like you heard from that person. Right, though. yeah. <laughs> so they actually can live up to 200 years. And, yeah. And um, they pretty much just die because they got sick or, you know, an otter ate them. Uh, and how this happens at the cellular level, so when we think about the DNA, uh, the instructions for life, it's all packaged up in this structure called a chromosome, which is pictured on the left. And the tips of those chromosomes have the structure called telomeres. And when we're very young and start out in life, all of our cells' chromosomes uh, have long telomeres. But every time a cell divides, in most animals, including humans, those telomeres shorten. And what happens, once they get too short, the cell is unable to uh, repair itself as well from DNA damage. It's not able to regenerate uh, tissue or growth, and so we you know, become haggard looking and older. <laughs> so in urchins, not all species, but several, they actually just never shorten their telomeres. They're just always like that. So scientists are trying to understand how that happens and if they can recreate that in the lab to probably sell really expensive skin cream. Right. <laughs> and then uh, real quickly, they can also um, 
regenerate, so they have long tube feet that you can ask about me later, they can regenerate those. And of course, sea stars can regenerate their entire arms. And what happens if you chop them off, they grow a little capsule full of stem cells. And somehow, again with memory, these cells know what to become the different parts of the arm. And lots of other animals do this, and so scientists study this to see how we can adapt that to, say, regrowing nerves or parts of your spinal cord. And the science is getting really close to, um, to helping those. Those problems. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Can you turn the lights back up? Yeah, yeah. All right. Last, uh, last but not least, before we've got about ten minutes for audience Q and A, um, back to Erica with Sherry. And spoiler alert for something that came out, you know, six months ago. <laughs> so I'll leave any type of spoilers out of it in case you haven't had a chance to see it yet. But of course, as an engineer, I love Sherry. She is absolutely an engineer in every sense in scientific form, but she's way more than that. As myself, I've done design, I've operated, I've done maintenance. What makes her the true superpower here is that she does it all at the same time. If I had the capability, or if humans had that same capability, I'd probably be unemployed. You know, most companies would not need a whole team. I work on cross-functional teams. I work with the people who do the maintenance. I work with the people who do design. I'm not them. I can't do it all at once. It's too inefficient. But if we could, you wouldn't need me. We just hire one engineer and they would do absolutely everything in the plant. So part of what makes her so awesome, you never saw a whole team around her because she didn't need them. She was excellent on her own. You know, in addition to being the inventor, what I love about seeing her is she absolutely goes through the engineering design process. They allow us to see her design. You know, she considers, okay, what is this person gonna do? What kind of material do I need? She's a material scientist. You cannot use every material everywhere. She knows the material, she knows what function it's gonna be in, and she designs to it. But it didn't always work. We've seen her fail before, and I love that part about it because we as engineers, it don't always work. It does fail, <laughs> and we get to see her fail, figure out and troubleshoot, well, why did it fail? And then she goes back to the drawing board and she does it. You know, so the idea of the enhanced speed, strength, senses, kind of gets more into the second one. So if you haven't, I kind of feel a type of way. So I'm really just going to speak to the engineering perspectives. And I myself am an engineer as well. Yeah, yeah, the actual superpowers. And it's just, yeah, yeah. no one's got a chance. I think the engineering power is a little better, but I may or may not be a little biased. <laughs> Well, and there was another science panel I went to, I think yesterday, where they were talking about, you know, the, one of the greatest scenes in the MCU is, you know, her, uh, Sherry trying to help out with vision and, and asking, well, why didn't you do this? And uh, Bruce Banner being like, because we didn't think of it. But you leave out the next line, which is her being like, I'm sure you tried your best. You know? <laughs> Love a sassy scientist. Um, all right, well, we'll take some audience Q&A. We've got more slides if there's not questions, but it looks like we already got some. So yes, you have a front here. All right, and the question is, uh, what shifts in human evolution do you foresee? So can I jump yeah. on this? So I will say with all the advancements in technology and kids having access to technology a lot earlier and then the government and politics say, putting a lot more emphasis in those resources for early child development. And just to break that down, has, did anybody in here have an iPhone in their hands at the age of five? Right, so that's what I'm trying to say. I think with that earlier access to all of those tools and resources, the brain is definitely gonna develop a lot differently for newer generations than it did for us. And not saying that we're dumb, we have, I think we have more manual um, ability than the newer generations who had more access to the things that skip straight to the answer without having to really work through them. Um, so I think it's, it's a toss-up, right? We have the pros and cons. We could probably work through a lot of ish, a lot of challenges a little bit more using our brains, using our hands, using the calculations and so on. Wherefore, they could probably get to the answer quicker using the access to the resources that are available that we never knew as much about and probably still trying to figure out how to use today. So I definitely will say the brain would develop a little bit differently for those now than for us. And think about a pandemic and so on, even with social anxieties, we're all changing a lot differently because of all those interactions, the access to a lot of things, the inaccessibility to those things, and et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, over here. Oh, and the question is about Henrietta Lacks and um, if her cells were used to create a superpower. Yeah, it sounds like you got something. Sure, yeah, I love that question. And I think 
I think the superpower that really, um, really we would give to is the superpower to learn about how everything works and really the basis to make all of these cures for these diseases, only not only today, but also what's coming in the future. These cells are still being used in the lab um, and um, they are just um, making it possible for us to learn more about ourselves and make a positive impact in the world in the future as well. Yeah. AKA the foundation. <laughs> yeah. All right, up front here. Um, I want to go back to the question. I, I work in education, and you're absolutely right. The, the brain is changing, and our educators are having to learn. Mm. We're, we're not teaching the information anymore. The information is at the touch of a finger. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing now is we're teaching how to use the information. Mm -hmm. So it's all critical thought and, and ethics. You know, like just because we can do something, should we? Right. You know, so we're either raising superheroes or supervillains. <laughs> but also looking at teaching versus educating, right? Yes. And I know that, so this is something that I am currently evolving into as a person that thought she was teaching my community about STEM and STEM careers and everything that I know and bringing other individuals like ourselves in front of those audiences, especially young and coming up kids, right? Um, understanding that educating it goes without restrictions and limitations and is usually exactly what those underserved, under-resourced populations need versus teaching where they already have the tools but you know, may not need as much educating to really inspire and motivate them. So I, I, I we could talk more about it because I can go on forever. And I don't want to. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. We, we've got five more minutes of Q and A, but we will also be available in the hallway. So if you've got more uh, things like that, uh, stick around. Uh, yes, uh, in the back there. Ah, great question. The plausibility of the teenage mutant ninja turtles and the secret of the ooze. Anyone got any thoughts? Uh, I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, it is possible in terms of uh, using different things to change uh, DNA, and scientists can do that in the lab by essentially stitching genes from one organism or plant into another. Uh, so one actually fun example is one of the people who studies the squid camouflage got a call one day from the people who were, you know, making the reboot of uh, Jurassic Park, <laughs> and so they asked them, you know, what genes from which animals would be used by the scientists in the film to create dinosaurs that then we can become invisible. <laughs> they did, yeah. They yeah, called this guy up, and um, he also has, when he presents, a lot of his slides have to be redacted because the Department of Defense is also very interested in how this happens and how they could make, yeah, of course they are, uh, wearable uh, camouflage skin or things that could reflect. Um, well, yeah. It, like, so yeah. I guess follow-up question is, would a some sort of ooze, I forget, radioactive or something like that, would it affect turtles and rats in the same way, right? Wouldn't it, I feel like it would react differently with their biology. Has anyone got a, thoughts about that? So, so that's actually one thing that's very important when, so, and we haven't talked about this enough here, and I know it's not the panel for it, but diversity in all research, engineering, technology, and math is very important when, we, when we're trying to advance those fields, right? So you have to be able to have a population that covers anything and everything that you're trying to improve. If you're trying to come out with a medication, you want to make sure you have enough of the people that are representative of the communities that you want to provide that medication to. And unfortunately, we do not have representation across all, um, especially ethnic groups, cultures, and so on, in the fields, but also the people that we're trying to help in those ways. So when we think about whether or not something is going to affect one thing differently than another, it is definitely possible, right? And the only way to find out is if you have a correct, what we call like variables to, to test against controls, which is enough diverse groups that to see whether or not these things are going to happen. So a pitch at the end, diversity is important in every aspect. <laughs> okay. I actually like that. From an analytics perspective, yeah. recall I mentioned AI. So if you've seen those pictures, you'll notice that for the people of color, they're not that good. If you want to know if it's an AI picture versus a real person, 
Look at their fingers. The models have not learned yet how to show people of color and what their fingers look like. Also, some sensors. I have a friend who all, you know, if you've been in the bathroom and you wash your hands, it never works. They can't recognize it. So part of building these models is because we built models off of one type of person, one type of skin color. Even for women, it doesn't always recognize women simply because it's only as good as the training data. They recognize that. So when they made these apps for, for us to do our pictures, it was so that they could do better. They wanted us, they wanted you to hop online, hey, they're all gonna do it. Now they've got the diverse data set that they need to make the models better. So again, representation, it matters. If we're the ones at the table that is helping, we can advance further, just like she said. Right. Yeah. All right. They are kicking us. Uh, they are kicking us out of the room, but we'll be right out here in the hallway to answer some more questions. Take a picture with our superhero scientists. Thank you so much for being here. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our panelists, everyone who came to the panel, and everyone who waited in line but wasn't able to get in. We're so sorry, but I'm glad you found the podcast episode. Thank you also to everyone who gave us great feedback and hung out after the panel to ask us cool questions. And thank all of you for listening. If you have an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert we should interview, let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies at gmail.com. That's S T A R W A R S O L O G I E S. We also have our fan group on Facebook. And please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and share this podcast on your favorite service. No topic is off limits, even whether a Wampa's mother is called a Mampa. So the Steam Pop Network put on six panels at Comic-Con 2023, and they'll all be online soon. Here on Star Wars Ologies, we're also sharing James's panels, Indiana Jones, and the Nexus of Archaeology, History, and Punching Fascists, as well as Star Wars Andor, Making a Rebel, Making a Rebellion. But the other panels are called Miss Marvel and the Power of Representation, Fear and Fungi, Science of the Last of Us, and Dr. Evil, Scientists as Villains in Pop Culture. So we'll share links for those as well when they're ready. Star Wars Ologies is part of the Skywalking Network. You can find all of their cool shows at skywalkingnetwork.com. We'll see you next time on Star Wars Ologies for James's panel, Star Wars Andor, Making a Rebel, Making a Rebellion.